the Denver Center for the Performing Arts Off Center and the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver present Mixed Taste, Tag Team Lectures on Unrelated Topics. And now, introducing tonight's unlikely pairing, Dr. Justina Ford and the banjo. Please welcome tonight's host, Sarah Bai. Hello, everyone. Wow, it is so good to see you all here in person. It is so great to be here. I am Sarah Bai. I am the Director of Programming over at the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Oh, I'm taking turns hosting, along with Charlie, uh, Mixed Taste all summer long. So for those of you who are here in the bar ballroom, I'll let you know that the bar is open all night. We have, yes, exactly, we have a very special drink. It is called 7,000 Banjos. So you'll want to check that out before the night is over. And in order to have viewers at home and people here in the ballroom participate, we have uh, a second screen experience just for you. And here's how it works. Scan the QR code that you see up here on your phone and hold your camera up, hold it over the QR code, and then tap the notification that pops up. If it's not working for you, you can also go to slido.com and enter in the code mixed taste, which is all one word. And that should take you to a web page with three tabs on the top of your screen where you can participate in the ideas chat, where you can take polls or quizzes or submit questions at the end of the show. So we're going to try it out and see how it works. So you may have seen this poll when you came in. And it's an easy one. This is, what instrument do you play? And this doesn't just mean, what instrument do you play well? Or what instrument are you currently playing? This is, what instrument can you play or have you ever played? So let's see what folks have played here before. We've got a lot of piano players in the audience. That is fantastic. A lot of guitar players as well. You're looking at one, once again. I didn't say you had to play well. Uh, some spoons players, some violins players. You know, this is surprising. I, I'm usually pretty good at recognizing this, and I thought for sure I saw some recorder players in the audience. <laughs> and I don't even, oh, there, it, it's coming up, it's coming up. And there's a lot of kazoo players too. All right, well, I think you got the hang of that. That's great. So now we're going to practice one more. We're going to practice in the ideas tab. So you can type in the name of other notable Coloradans that you might like to see featured in future mixed taste lectures. So I don't know, maybe you want to learn more about John Elway or uh, another sports figure. So we can type in Hickenlooper, Peyton Manning. Uh, what, other, what other famous Coloradans or notable Coloradans might you be interested in seeing? Not all at once, though. Oh, here we go. Elizabeth Piper Inslee, the bartender. Oh, a notable Coloradan. John Denver, there you go. Madam C.J. Walker, all right. I think you've got the hang of it. Let's get started. Mixed Taste is a mashup lecture series where we bring together two experts who each speak on different topics for 20 minutes, and then we take question and answer on both topics at the same time. That's right. The rules are very simple. During the first part, we allow no connections between the topics. But during the Q&A, anything can happen. So between the talks tonight, we'll play a quick game. And at the end of the evening, a local poet will perform an original poem inspired by the two talks. So I'm excited to introduce our first speaker tonight. She'll be speaking on Dr. Justina Ford, Terry Gentry. Terry is a volunteer docent at the Black American West Museum and Heritage Center. She's also on the board. She uh, is, uh, this is housed in the former ho home of Dr. Justina Ford. So please give a warm welcome for Terry, to Terry Gentry. Thank you. Good evening. Good. That's better. How are you this evening? We, we appreciate you coming out this evening. I'm really excited to talk about Dr. Justina Ford, who's one of my heroes. She's the first black woman licensed doctor in Colorado. And she practiced from 1902 to 1952. 
So I have a little presentation here that I'll share with you about Dr. Ford. We'll go back into her history. These three pictures that I'm showing, the first one is her high school graduation picture in 1890. And the middle one is one that's very popular. A lot of our community would talk about all of the cool hats that she wore during her lifetime. And the third picture is with her great nephew, Jean Carter. She never had children of her own, but she had several nieces and nephews, and she had 7,000 babies out there <laughs> that she took care of. So we always say she didn't have kids of her own, but she did have 7,000 babies. She spoke up to 11, you know, 8 to 11 languages and dialects so that she could converse with her patients, and she helped in our community take care of more than 37 different nationalities. So this is a little timeline of Dr. Ford. She was born January 22, 1871 in Knoxville, Illinois. And later on, her family moved to Galesburg, Illinois, and she graduated high school there. In 1892, she married Reverend John Ford. And then she continued at Herring Medical College and graduated in 1899. She practiced a brief time in Illinois. They moved to Normal, Alabama, and she practiced a short time down there. And then Reverend John Ford was called to minister here in Denver at one of the two oldest black churches in Colorado, Zion Baptist Church. So he was called out in 1900. Dr. Ford followed immediately after that and was granted her medical license in 1902 but denied membership to the Colorado Medical Society. You had to have that membership to be on staff at the hospitals, so she set up practice in her home. And in 1911, she purchased a home at 2335 Arapahoe Street and continued her practice there. She practiced until 1952. In 1949, she wrote another letter to the Colorado Medical Society asking them to grant her membership. So they finally did January 1950, 48 years later. And we have a copy of the letter in our file at the museum. In the letter, she stated her credentials, including that she had attended the delivery of more than 7,000 babies. So she had the membership and paid for the membership, which expired when she passed away, so they gave her husband a refund. <laughs> yeah. A few a couple years later, her husband, well, to go back, Reverend Ford and Dr. Ford actually ended up getting a divorce, and he moved to Florida. And so then a, a couple of years later, she married Alfred Allen. And they remained married until she passed away. And then Mr. Allen sold the house a couple of years after she passed away. And the gentleman that owned the home, he owned it, I guess, for about 30 years. He was, he sold the home to a developer in the early 80s, and it was slated to be torn down. So the neighbors contacted our city council member, Hiawatha Davis, and Paul Stewart, who founded the museum. They filed an injunction in the courts to stop them from tearing down the house. So the developer said, well, I don't need the house, I need the land. So you can have the house if you can move it. So they loaded the house on a truck and drove it down Stout Street to, 20, to 3091 California Street in 1984. So I'll go back and show you Zion Baptist Church and, and Shorter AME Church just to have a reference, a point of reference about the two old black churches in Colorado. Zion Baptist Church membership started meeting in 1863. And they formally organized in 1865. Shorter AME Church membership started meeting in 1864, purchased the building in 1866, and formally organized in 1868. And both churches are still very active parts of our community. This is a picture of the house on a truck driving down Stout Street. So I, I, I like to tell you that they moved the house, but then I need to show you what that looks like because it's hard to wrap your brain around what it really looked like driving down the street. So they moved the house to 2335 from 2335 Arapahoe Street to 3091 California Street in 1984. 
and the house underwent restoration for four years, and then Mr. Stewart, who founded the museum, moved the museum here in 1988. So these are pictures of the house as it sat at 3091 California Street just before the renovation. The house in the middle is what it's looked like for the last 30 years. And then this past year during the pandemic, we've had some restoration work done, and the house on the right is what the museum looks like today. This is what it's looked like for the last few months, and they're still working on replacing the windows and things like that, so we hope to reopen in about a month or so. This is Paul Stewart, who founded the museum in 1971. Mr. Stewart grew up in Clinton, Iowa, and as a child played cowboys and Indians, and sometimes he wanted to play the cowboy. His friends would tell him, there's no such thing as black cowboys. So in 1962, he came out here to visit his cousin, Earl Mann, who was a five-term state legislator, and they were walking in downtown Denver, and he met a black cowboy. And he was amazed by that introduction and thought that he was you know, just performing or something like that, but found out the gentleman actually owned property north of Denver and had cattle, had horses, and just really inspired Mr. Stewart. So we moved back to Denver a few years later and opened a barber shop over on East 34th Avenue and Elizabeth Street and started asking a lot of his patrons about their family history. And they brought pictures and artifacts and family stories, and pretty soon all that outgrew the barber shop, so we started the museum in 1971 at Clayton College, which is over on... Martin Luther King and Colorado Boulevard. Then he moved to the basement of KDKO, our black radio station, for about 15 years. And then once the house was restored, he moved the museum there, and we've been there ever since. So these are some of the pictures of, of Mr. Stewart and other supporters of the museum, including uh, Charles and Alta Cousins history in the, in the Five Points neighborhood, and Reverend Ford was part of the Golden Chest Mining Company back in the day as well. The Ford Warren Library is located at 2825 High Street, and before that was at 3354 High Street. It was named for Dr. Justina Ford and Bishop Henry White Warren. So it's still an active library, and they're still very supportive of the museum. We work in tandem on a lot of different projects. These are some wonderful pictures of our Five Points neighborhood, and there is this incredible mural now over at the U.S. Bank building on 27th and Welton Street. So I'm going to give you that as a homework assignment to go by and see this beautiful mural. All of those folks standing in front of the mural are Ford babies. Isn't that cool? They're, they're, they came out to celebrate Dr. Ford's mural last year when it was put in place. The woman at the top there is Terry Nelson. She is the director of the Blair Caldwell African American Research Library, and they are also one of our major supporters in the efforts to move forward the, the museum and keep Dr. Ford's memory in celebration. And we have several other folks down there in the pictures. Someday, when you have five minutes, I can do a, another presentation that will take an hour, hour and a half to talk about all these folks. <laughs> these are members of the board of directors. At the top left is Daphne Rice Allen, who's the chair of the board. Dr. Denise Ladon is our vice chair. Ernest Reese. We have members of our community that support it, including University of Northern Colorado. So we've got a couple of professors there, Bob Brunswick and George June, and some of the other board members are reenactors. Moya Hansen, who retired from History Colorado. This is a really important, critical piece to the museum and its, its function. So we've got uh, reenactors that talk about Dr. Justina Ford as well. So when you're out in the community looking around at the history, especially if you're in the Five Points, Curtis Park, Whittier neighborhoods, Dr. Ford touched all of those neighborhoods. We've actually had people come into the museum to talk about making sure that we take care of her legacy. One of the families was up past Greeley, Colorado, and for a short time they lived in the, in the Five Points neighborhood and she delivered their dad. So we have people from all over the state that come in and talk about to lift up Dr. Ford and make sure we keep her legacy 
intact. Some of the wonderful stories that I've heard about relative to Dr. Ford is one of the rumors was that she delivered a baby on average once every three days for 50 years. The Martinez family came in when we had a celebration to celebrate Dr. Ford because she delivered uh, the Martinez sister who at the time was 83 and her brother was 70. And Dr. Ford asked the sister to help her bring her little brother into the world. And she also took care of their mom who had become ill and unfortunately, even though she had some hospital privileges, it was not consistent. And her mother, their mother was ill and in 1950 she passed away because Dr. Ford could take care of her while she was at home, but then she was so gravely ill she needed to be admitted to the hospital and they would not let her come in and take care of her. So that's one of the experiences that that family had. So, so that's another thing we say in addition to the 7,000 babies, she had 7,000 families that she took care of. She took care of the babies, she was a pediatrician, and she was a general practitioner. So she took care of the babies, the brothers and sisters, the mamas and the dads. Sometimes people couldn't pay the bill, so she would make payment arrangements or they might give her something in, in, in return, like, oh, we've got some vegetables and things in our garden, we'll pay you with that. Or can I come do a little maintenance work at your home? Or Dr. Ford might go out and buy them groceries and, and buy coal for them so that they could sustain themselves. So we have thousands and thousands of stories about the amazing work that Dr. Ford did for our community. In addition to taking care of these families and helping them come into the world, she helped sustain these families so that they could live wonderful, meaningful lives. She was an amazing individual. My, my grandmother talked about her uh, as an aunt, and, and our families were, were tightly connected. My great-grandfather and my great-grandmother were very dear friends with Dr. Ford. So I didn't get a chance to meet her personally because I was born after she passed away, but her nieces and nephews, we called them cousins because of, of this wonderful history that our families had. In addition to all of the other families in our community, we have uh, three and four generations of folks in our community that have a lot of reverence and respect for the work that Dr. Ford conducted in our community. So she will always, always be part of our legacy and our history. In the Five Points, Curtis Park, Whittier, San Rafael, those neighborhoods, and anywhere in, in different places around the, the state where people scattered. So this is Ford Elementary School in Centennial and we had a wonderful conversation with them last year because they've opened the school and named it Dr. Justina Ford in her honor. I'm so humbled and excited about that. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that wonderful? And this is their, their mantra, their vision, mission, and beliefs. They have an incredible game plan for their students. And, and Dr. Ford is an example for their students. I think this is just incredible. Dr. Ford also received Human Rights Award from the Cosmopolitan Club. She's in our Colorado Black Hall of Fame. She's in the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. And we celebrated Dr. Ford's 150th birthday on January 22nd. And we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the museum this year as well. So Governor Polis did a, a proclamation for her birthday. And we had Dr. Justina Ford Day on January 22nd. Isn't that wonderful? This is a statue on the bottom there that Jess E. Du Bois carved and, and designed for a bronze statue. It's across the street from the museum at the light rail station at 30th and Downing. And, and Jesse Du Bois' dad was one of the owners of Wink's Lodge up in Lincoln Hills. So that's another story we need to talk about. The Black Resort west of 
Denver, Lincoln Hills. He was one of the owners there. So there's a lot of stories about that with our jazz history as well. But Mr. Du Bois is a wonderful individual with his incredible art work and Manual High School graduate too. So that I will conclude about this. This is a, a brief moment in time I'm talking about you, talking to you about Dr. Ford. But I just hope that you understand that her impact on our community and our lives for 50 years in the Denver community is second to none. She, she gained her, her acumen and desire to help people working with her mom, her parents, uh, Melissa and Pryor Warren. She used to go out with her mom who was a nurse. So she's had this, this innate desire to help people since she was a little bitty thing and continue to expand her reach and impact. And she still impacts our community in 2021. It has never ceased. And people aspire to, to be the kind of physician and the kind of humanitarian that Dr. Ford was during her lifetime. Thank you all so much for your time. All right, feel free to take a quick break if you need to grab another drink, another 7,000 banjos from the bar while we play a quick game between our talks tonight. So I, I'm going to put the QR code back up on the screen so you can play along in case you need it. And I'm going to invite tonight's poet to join us as well. Mahogany, would you like to come on out? All right, Mahogany is going to play along. Now, this is a, a trivia game that we came up with to connect Dr. Justina Ford, a woman who's delivered 7,000 babies, to the banjo. So we decided to call this game Deliverance. <laughs> Beat you to it. I knew you all had that joke queued up. All right, so this is how it works. This is a trivia game. You can play along on Slido, and Mahogany is going to play along up here with Definitely. me. All right. Uh, are you ready, Mahogany? Yes. Okay. The first one is to see how well you were listening during the first talk. So here we've got our first question. Originally constructed at 2335 Arapaho Street, Dr. Justina, Ford, Dr. Justina Ford's residence and office is now the home of the, is it the Rossonian Hotel? Is it the Black American West Museum? Is it the Molly Brown House? Or is it the Blair Caldwell African American Research Library? Mahogany. I'm going to go with Black American West Museum. All right. For 100, Alex. <laughs> Let's see what the audience says. All right. We've got 100% of the audience guessing the Black American West Museum. That is very good. You are all listening. Now it's going to get a little bit harder. All right. Okay. Our next question is about the banjo. This is a topic that you presumably know nothing about yet. So here, we'll see how you do. This song, Dueling Banjos, was previously released under what title? Is it Banjo Explosion? Is it War of the Banjos? Is it Feudin Banjos? Or is it Twin Banjo Duel? What do you, what do you think? I'm just going to go with what gravitates towards me and, and take a look. Can I, can I phone a friend? <laughs> you can phone a friend. Uh, that's the audience. We can... Uh, okay. We can see. Audience, what do you say? Oh, we're thinking feud and banjos. You think they're thinking feud and banjos. All right, well, let's see what they're thinking. A lot of you are thinking feud and banjos, 47%. And if you were thinking that, you are correct. I think he Googled it. <laughs> feud and banjos, the song, was originally written and recorded in 1955 by Arthur Guitar Boogie Smith. He sued and won when he was not given a writing credit for dueling banjos from the very movie Deliverance. So if you guessed dueling, feuding banjos, you are correct. And now we're back to some Denver history. So here's the question. What is the first public park in Denver? Is it Washington Park? Is it City Park? Is it the city of Cuernavaca Park, my favorite park? Is it Mestizo Curtis Park? What are you, what are you going to go with? He's going to go with Washington Park. I heard him, I heard him, I yeah. heard him. Oh. Um, see, I hear some whispers here. I'm going to go with Washington. Okay. Mahogany's got Washington Park. Let's see what the audience has got. Okay. I was going to say City Park. 53% of you said City Park. If you said City Park, you are 
wrong. Oh, I wasn't going to say that. I wasn't going to say that. It is Monsieur Curtis Park. That's right. 26% of you. Hi, that is your correct our, our answer. It was originally founded in 1898, called Curtis Park. The uh, Mestizo was added to the name in 1986 to reflect the mix of cultures and ethnicities that who live in that neighborhood. So oh. that is the correct answer. It is Denver's oldest park. And now, back to the banjo. Okay. All right. Which pop song featuring the banjo reached the highest position on Billboard's Hot 100 singles chart? Is it Gentle on My Mind by Glenn Campbell? Is it You Ain't Going Nowhere by The Birds? Is it Sweet City Woman by the Stampeders, or is it Take It Easy by the Eagles? Hmm. What's your guess? I'm going to go Sweet City Woman. Sweet City Woman by the Stampeders. Let's see what our audience said. Oh, only 16% of you said Sweet City Woman by the Stampeders, and that is too bad because, Mahogany, you are correct. Sweet. Sweet City Woman yes. peaked at number eight on the U.S. Hot 100 chart in 1971. That means it's been 50 years since we have had a banjo hit on the Hot 100 chart. Do we even have the Hot 100 I chart? I don't even I know don't what even that know is. Either. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Stefan, I think it's time. I, I think the time has come. All right. Two more questions tonight. This one takes us back to Denver history and to the neighborhood of Five Points. The Deep, Walk, Wa Deep Rock Artisanal Water and Bottling Company has been a fixture in the Five Points neighborhood. Is it since 1898? Is it since 1932? Is it since 1975? Or is it since the year 2001, a space odyssey, a water odyssey? Mm. What do you think? I think I'm going to go with 1932. 1932. Mm -hmm. It's a good guess. Let's see what our audience said. Most of you thought it is 1932. In fact, 56% of you did, but you would be incorrect. I was so the Deep Rock back. Water Company actually came to Five Points in 1898. It's been in its same location on 20 or oh, wow. 27th and Welton Street all of those years, which raises a lot of questions. I wonder if the well is actually underneath it. I might have to ask Terry after, after the show. Our final question tonight is a banjo question. All right, so warm up your banjo brains. Where is the Banjo Hall of Fame located? I can tell by your face you haven't been there, Mahogany. So is it in Nashville, Tennessee? Is it in Memphis, Tennessee? Is it in St. Louis, Missouri? Or Oklahoma City, Oklahoma? Hmm. All great cities. I feel like Nashville and Memphis are too obvious. Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. What did the audience say? 40% of you thought Oklahoma City. So did Mahogany. And all of you were correct. Oh. Yes, the American Banjo Museum and Hall of Fame, which honors all types of banjo playing, construction design, and instruction, opened in 2013 in Oklahoma City. I think these questions about banjos were too easy for you. In fact, you guys seem to know quite a lot about the banjo, and you're going to learn even more tonight. Thank you so much, Mahogany. No problem. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, for those of you who have, are here in the ballroom, you may have noticed at the back of the room a book table where you can buy books. We've partnered this year with the Tattered Cover Bookstore to curate a list of books called Mixed Taste Reads. And it's a summer reading list inspired by this season's lineup. Each week there will be more books on sale, and you can also purchase them online through Tattered Cover's website. Best of all, a portion of all the proceeds benefit the Denver Center for the Performing Arts and MCA Denver. And now I would like to introduce our next guest who will be teaching us even more about the banjo. Stefan Brackett is the music ambassador of Colorado. He is a member of the experimental rock rap group, The Flowbots. He co-founded the No Enemies Project and also Youth on Record. Please give a warm welcome to Stefan Brackett. All right, y'all. I'm, I consider myself pretty nerdy, but I actually didn't know the answer to most of those banjo ones. Y'all are definitely up on me. Um, 
And also, I'm still reeling from the previous presentation. I was one of those Denver kids who uh, grew up having uh, the black cowboy Paul Stewart come to your class, and it was amazing. It was so incredible. Um, just to be able to see a fuller story, especially about the place that you were. Um, all right, so I'm going to kind of get this going. Uh, I'm Stefan. That is my family. I am at the top. Um, at the bottom is my father, William Brackett, and the middle is my mother, Ava Brackett, and that's me on top. When I talk to my sister about it, I call that the good old days because she wasn't there yet, but just, <laughs> just so y'all know, because I couldn't find a great picture with all of us, there she is. Now, you might be wondering why am I starting off a talk about banjo with photos of my family. Well, there's many reasons for it. Uh, one of them is that in my family, uh, both my mother and my father's side of the family were from the South. They both grew up under Jim Crow. Um, we are most certainly the descendants of slaves and been in this country for centuries. And with all the different values and beliefs that my families possess, there was one word that was forbidden. I never heard my family say it. It was banjo. <laughs> um, there are many reasons for that. Um, but like the main reason is this. Um, and the reason that I'm talking about this in the context of family is it's also how this instrument um, in its journey represents so much of the complexity and the contradictory nature of what this country is in history and in mythology and the tales that we tell about it and the tales that we tell about this thing itself. The reason that my family never talked about banjo is that the instrument itself stood to them, like stood for making fun of blackness. Um, particularly with um, my parents who grew up in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, uh, the dark cloud of, what is that, um, grease paint, charcoal, um, and indignity left a scar on my family where this instrument was believed to be like the kind of, in some ways, the icon of how our people have been disrespected in this country, which was complex for me because as a kid, I loved the banjo. <laughs> I, I had this secret desire that I couldn't speak about it. Something about it sung to me. It haunted me every time I heard it. And I would have to like sneak out of my house to find tidbits and pieces, um, going wherever I could. And whenever I did, I felt this deep connection and this guilt because I knew, even though it was unspoken, it's one of those things you knew that this freaking thing was forbidden. Now, guessing with how like, all of you answered, can you tell me where does the banjo come from? Wrong. No, no, you're right, you're right. You're totally right. <laughs> you're totally right. <laughs> yes, it comes, it comes from Africa. Um, the earliest uh, version of the banjo um, was believed to have been found around the 1500s. Um, and like the ancestors of the banjo, you can still find them all throughout Africa. And this image actually is of the olding existing banjo. Um, and that was built, I believe it goes back to around uh, the 1700s. And um, this was when a lot of the banjos that were found were first believed to come over from the continent to plantations in South America, where they called it the banza. Um, but the banjo itself is, um, what would you call it, a passenger on the triangle trade. It's a passenger on the slave trade. It's, it's one of those things where the stories are so hidden 
that we don't know the true story. It's just like, to make an odd comparison, the earthworm, where a lot of us assume that earthworms have been in North America the entire time. That is not true. The earthworm came over on slave ships, and it also came over with fishermen. Because a lot of the times in the triangle trade, if y'all aren't familiar with it, there was the slave trade before that was bringing bodies to America. But an innovator by the name of Sir Basil Hawkins, he was knighted for his innovation, figured out that if you created three stops from Africa to America to Spice Islands, then you could have, you could triple your profits. So you, at each of the stops, you'd be making money or picking something up. And because of that trade, sometimes ships might even show up to America with empty. Now, you can't have a boat make an intercontinental a trip if it's empty. It will sit too high in the water. It'll be too volatile to get knocked over. So you have to fill it with dirt. So they'd fill it with dirt from Europe, bring it over to the U.S., dump that dirt out. And that's how the earthworm, how some of the earthworms came to this country. All right? In many ways, that's how the banjo came to this country. Now, the earliest versions of the banjo were gourds with skin stretched over them and a stick and strings usually made from like intestine or gut or something like that. Now, when slaves came over and they brought this instrument in earlier form, one of the things was that even without the gourds, even without access to many things, still the basic form of this was really accessible and easy to make. You could use just a rim of metal. You could use a broomstick. Um, you could use metal wires. And so we started seeing banjos kind of like start repopulating via the slave kind of highway. So coming up from South America all the way up to North America. And it was in the 1850s that we started seeing the leap where white slave owners were like, hey, why don't you show me how, how you play that? Because it was exotic. It was fun. It was, um, as some people described it back in the day, it was carnal. Now, I don't know how many of you all have thought of the banjo as a carnal instrument, but <laughs> um, in the 1870s, after uh, you got to see both the African and European influences coincide, the African influences being the drum and the basic design, the European influences kind of being the adding of the tuning pegs and eventually frets. It went from an instrument of carnal savagery to a polite parlor instrument for young ladies of society to play. And, um, but it still kept its little sexy sensuality. Um, <laughs> So it was believed to be an instrument that like, uh, women of society would play to woo their uh, paramours. And so I think that's what the, the, the carnality was kind of like the, uh, the aphrodisiac, <laughs> emphasis on the afro. Um, <laughs> but, but in that, like, we, we still get to see, does this story sound that dissimilar to the way that African Americans have been talked about in this country? And at the same time, I have to tell you, I'm going to hop, I'm hopping my story real quick. I'm going to move to something that you all won't expect. How many of you all love Twitter? I hate it. I hate it. But Twitter brought me one good thing. When I was on tour, I was feeling down, down in the dumps. Tour can often be very desolating. I reached out on Twitter and I was like, hey y'all, quick poll. Should I get a PS3, like a PlayStation 3 for those of y'all need the translation, or should I get a banjo? The banjo won by two votes. <laughs> so, and I think I needed just a little bit of external help to push through the taboo to actually start playing this thing, of which I play at a really amateur level. So I'm coming to you, not as somebody's like, yes, let me play the banjo for you. I'm talking to you about, I am talking to you all about the banjo because this has been a path of self-discovery. This has been an act of taking something back. Um, because even though the banjo was a forbidden topic in my household, as I started playing it, I started learning its actual history. And then when I learned its history, 
I realized that it was mine to begin with. And so we can look at this instrument and know that in the 1850s, it became popular. And during the Civil War, the banjo was believed to be a prized item that you would take off the corpse of a soldier after battle. Both Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers would go into battle with the banjos on their back. By some accounts, they believed that the Civil War was the most musical war in the history of the world because so many people were walking with these things. Um, what is it? Uh, Abraham Lincoln's bodyguard, one of the reasons that he was hired is because he was so good with the banjo. And he would soothe President Lincoln, who was like now known to be um, um, manic depressive, like when he's having his depressive spells, his bodyguard would play the banjo and be able to lull him to sleep with its music. So we see the banjo being a fixture at one of the crisis inflection points of the identity of this nation. Um, and then we see, after that, the banjo actually became the most popular instrument in the United States of America. Like in the 1860s after the war, the 1870s with the real rise in popularity of minstrelry, which, as I showed you that image, that's when white performers would perform black music to look, and they painted their, their faces to look like black musicians. Um, and then like, you even see it, like, even, like if you're trying to sit down and watch White Christmas, which I made the mistake of doing a year or two ago, and I forgot about that whole scene where they're like, don't you miss minstrelry? Do you all remember that? Have you seen that? There's a whole music scene where there's like, they got like the black face things in the back, like, oh, we should get back to that halcyon era of cultural, like the high point of culture. But like, honestly, it was, it was so incredibly popular. It was kind of like disco in the 70s, um, which also was appropriative. You can look at most of our massive trends and you can see that there's usually a black root at the base of the tree that usually creates white leaves that get celebrated. But this has been a journey for me. Um, and in this journey, I also look to my role as an activist, as an educator. So other examples that we have are Pete Seeger, who, with his banjo, taught movements to sing brought communities together. He reintroduced old-time music, which is, in its own way, kind of a melange of all these people who came here. And in that melange, I find my ancestry. Slaves who came from Western Africa, sharecroppers who came from Scotland and Ireland, settled in North Carolina and Appalachia, shared their music together, created stuff like country, where you can still clearly hear the, the ancestors of it. Like, you can hear the West African downbeat, the boom, 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 boom. And then you can hear the Gaelic melody, da 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 boom, boom, boom. Country, right? But from old-time music, we get that melange that gives us all of these amazing things. But at the same time, as somebody who is proudly here as a descendant of slaves who has come here with some European modifications, um, many of them unasked for and made without permission. I still stand in the middle of a story that is not finished. To this day, as a descendant of slaves, it has to be understood that there are up to 40 million slaves who are enslaved today on this planet right now. Hundreds of thousands of them in the United States of America. Many of them have come in this week because of the All-Star Game. As somebody who is the descendants, a descendant of slaves, if I don't speak to modern enslavement, I am speaking spitting upon the sacrifices of my ancestors. So with this instrument, 
that has always represented the contradiction that is America, the tensions that is America. I am stepping into the tension right now knowing that there are enslaved people today who need to be elevated and spoken about. It's not as though they do not have voices. There's no, the banjo is not the story of people without voice. It's about whether or not you're including their voices in the first place or you're tuning them out. When the story got tuned out about where this instrument came from, it allowed my family to not know a portion of their contributions. And that's what happens. When you tell a part of the story, you hide the history, and you don't get to see the fullness of what people are bringing to the table. So with that, I am going to share a song with y'all that is a combination of what I do. I would never step into a room and say I'm a banjo player. I would happily step into a room and say that I'm a rapper. So this is my combination of the two things, which I think the, this instrument is always represented. But with that, <clears throat> I am, oh, and I totally forgot, I just want to highlight some of the best banjo players who really inspire me. So Rihanna, uh, Rihanna Glidden's from the Carolina Chocolate Drops, and now is like an incredible soloist and probably one of the best musicians this country has spawned in the last 20 years. And then also, uh, just in, up in Fort Collins, Saja Butler, super dope. Um, we're supposed to be having some lessons soon. I just wanted to kind of highlight some places you can go and like hear black hands on the banjo at a virtuosic level. But with this, I am going to do a medley speaking to this contradiction. So the songs that are going to be put together are The House of the Rising Sun, which is believed to be a folk song talking about being in a life of prostitution. And the animals changed the pronouns in a way that I feel like robbed it of its power and just made it a bop. And so I want to take that back. And at the same time, I'm going to be adding um, In the Pines, uh, which was sung by Lead Belly's wife, and then ending with Amazing Grace, because I feel like all of those songs speak of pain and in singing them, the possibility of redemption. All right. There is a house in New they call the rising sun It's been the rules of many a young child And God, I know I'm one Dear Mama I couldn't keep my promise I couldn't break the chains of profit From the cotton field to lock up Yielding gross domestic product In this most depressing saga I'll still shout down Babylon And call out the Pontius Pilots This is domestic violence Witness our best and brightest silence It's time to shake it off And call an antifada Fathers, daughters, mothers, sons We need a new tomorrow When we fill the streets You can hear my people call My girl My girl don't lie to me Tell me where did you sleep last night In the pines, in the pines Where the sun don't ever shine I'll shiver the whole night through this is madness, salvage teams can't bandage Hope when it's damage or broken compassion There's not enough rope in the van when the world is collapsed And our mode of action, broadcast the glass All we can manage, donate with the plastic scrap and the salad Open the balance, emotions are validated Stage on 4-3 aspect, another man down, another mother gone Child drowned, another silent song Solitude, another kind of strong I love you, another stronger along Those missing in action, another page Is black and burnt, turn ashes to ashes Dust off the flags and the caskets Amazing Now I'm 
I'm found I was blind But now I see Was blind But now I see I share that with you, like knowing that it's nothing that I do with a whole lot of skill in this case. As a professional musician, I wanted to come up here and do something that wasn't perfect because this is where I am at this phase in my process. And as much as we have been exposed to a lot of different stories, presenta presentations, and things that are supposed to be perfect, I feel like let some things be messy. And in that messiness, maybe we can have some curiosity and we can start looking in the gaps and find the stories that are hidden. Thank you. Oh, maybe. Oh, thank you, Stefan. I really enjoyed that. All right, now it's time to get started with the Q&A. All right, so we are going to have you type the questions on your phone. This is the symbol. I guess this is typing on your phone. So we'll pull up the QR code again. For you who may not have participated in all of the other things, join for our second screen. So if you submit your questions in the Q&R, or the Q&A tab, you're going to want to include your name. And that is so you can be eligible to win the prize for the best question at the end of the night. So you need your name if you would like to win the prize. And now we are going to bring up our speakers again for the Q&A. Please join us, Terry and Stefan. We're going to encourage you to draw connections between both topics at the same time, if you can. And we're going to celebrate those connections with the gong which we're bringing up as well. Okay, All right, and we're going to give a very special prize tonight at the end of the show to the person who draws the best connection between the topics. All right, so let's get started. And uh, I'm going to work on calling the questions up here on my phone. Okay. Not all at once, <laughs> y'all. Okay, so, uh, oh, here we go. We've got, we've got a question from Roberta, and she asks, what is the best banjo song to play while moving a house on a truck? <laughs> oh, that, that was bad going here. Let's give this a minute. Fantastic. There we go. Best banjo song Fantastic. to play while moving a house on a truck. That's a question for both of you, really. Okay, well, I think in some ways it depends on what you define as a banjo song. Because I think you can play just about anything on the banjo. So then that opens up a whole bunch of things. Keep on trucking. <laughs> oh, moving right along, right? Uh, the Muppets, there's banjo in that. Um, oh, goodness. Uh, what do you think? That's a tough one. Oh, wait, wait, come on. What's, what's yeah. the song? Uh, we built this house. Oh, gosh. Um, oh, man. Um, no, no, that doesn't work. Solid Like a Rock doesn't work. Um, yeah, yeah, I think the moving right along sounds is, is the one to go. All right. Uh, That's a good one. Do you have a favorite banjo song that you would use to move a house, Terry? <laughs> Oh, man. Um, maybe you could modify Amazing Grace a little bit because we're trying to honor our, our community when we mm -hmm. move the house and honor our history. So Amazing Grace with a little banjo background might be good. There we go. All right. We've got, a, we've got another question here uh, for around the banjo. Uh, how can the banjo be used to heal a history of hurt? Um... 
I, I think that like the Carolina Chocolate Drops have done a whole lot. I don't know if you've ever seen them perform. They don't perform anymore, but um, any one of the members, whenever they perform, they also give the history. And I think in giving the history and playing it as they do, it brings healing. But then also, there's another history of hurt that comes from all the banjo players, from all the jokes. All the banjo jokes, man. <laughs> Like, it's, I think it's the instrument that's just like the red-headed stepchild of instruments. Like, there's bumper stickers. It's like, what, what is it? Um, what do you do when you hear banjo music? Like, paddle faster or something like that. You know, like, <laughs> like just, just like so many. I remember I went to a website that had like maybe 200 banjo jokes, and they all cut to the quick. So I, th I think we need to... I had some banjo jokes queued up earlier tonight. Oh, see, see. so glad see. That, that I cut them from the script. <laughs> Oh my goodness! And like, just like yeah, the hate is so casual. Um, yeah, that has to change. Stop making fun of the banjo. Stop. I mean, and I, I want to know why it has such a hokey image. Well, maybe that. But in the, in the banjo's yes. defense, uh, in the banjo joke book that I read, it said that every. Did you buy a banjo joke? Of course book? I didn't buy it. Did you no. get it from the library? What did you do? No, there's the internet stuff, and it's full of resources for <laughs> people who love to make jokes about instruments. And it says that there, are, there is the stepchild of every instrument family. For example, the tuba falls in that category. Maybe you have tubo jokes as well. I have not heard... Come on. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. All right, let's see what other questions we've got. Um, uh, Let's see, the, this is a new technology, so please have patience with me while I learn to scroll through uh, uh, looking for a question about Dr. Justina Ford. So, of course, people are asking if Dr. Justina Ford played any instruments like a banjo and want to know uh, a little bit more about, about her musical life, if she had one. <laughs> I'm not aware of her playing any instruments. I would imagine if she did, it probably would, be, would have been the piano. But I can't imagine that with her busy lifestyle, she had time to even think about it. <laughs> she was so focused on taking care of our community, and she was working all the time. So I don't know if that was ever part of it. And she was First Lady of Zion Baptist Church for a while, and I haven't seen any stories about anything relative to music when Reverend John Ford was, was the minister there. So that's something I'll have to dig into and see if someone else can give me an update on it. But I, I'm not aware of anything. I'm wondering, though, like, First Lady to Baptist Church? Mm -hmm. When have you seen a First Lady who's not dope at the band, at the uh, tambourine? She could have been, but <laughs> well, half the time when he was at church preaching, she was out. Oh, it's true. Taking care of a That's baby. True. So she, she worked day and night. Wow. And I don't think she got much sleep based on her life experience. I mean, her, her home was her space. Yeah. And so you had people sitting in there that needed help all, all the time. time. So they had a cab company that drove her to her different, mm -hmm. different visits. So she, she did a lot of house calls and she was working around the clock. So I Did just, she deliver those 7,000 babies at their homes? In or, their home. Or in her office? In or both. their home. Oh, my goodness. She was, she was going to the neighbors, taking care of them in their home. And even she was, she was a homeopathic physician, okay. so she was very conscious about how she took care of those folks. And she would go into somebody's home. She'd take off her dress and, and deliver the baby in her slip because she didn't want to contaminate the area. Mm -hmm. But back then, she couldn't go to the hospital to deliver the baby. She was going to the person's home to take care of them. People were coming to her home for other things. Like my dad, when he was little, injured his arm. He, he went to her home for her to take care of him there. So she never took time off. She was working all the time. And babies don't come on a schedule. They come every time of the day and night. Well, and sometimes she spent the night at somebody's house. They were in labor, mm -hmm. and she was spending the night at their home while they were going through 20 hours of labor. So it's, it's not like, oh, the baby will be here in five minutes. She, she was there 
for hours at a time. And then if, if somebody was ill, she would be there for hours and hours taking care of them and looking after them. So she was working all the time. Oh, wow. All right, we've got a question from O-Dog. This, okay. is a, this is a crossover question. Since the banjo was used to help Lincoln with his depression, would Dr. Ford consider, consider it as a medical instrument for her patients? And I believe we can yeah. celebrate this with the gong. I would say yes. That's a good one. I would, I would say yes. Being a homeopathic physician, she used a lot of natural remedies to take care of her folks. She didn't believe in artificial remedies. So, for example, if you had a headache, you, you got a cold compress and put it on your forehead and on your neck to, to bring your blood pressure down. She didn't give you a lot of artificial things, and she took what caused your illness. So if you had a bee sting, then you get the, the antivenom from, you know, you make an antivenom from the bee to take care of you. And she found a lot of natural remedies to take care of folks. So if a banjo's going to calm you down and make your life better, she's going to say, that's a good way to go. Yeah, 20 cc's of banjo. <laughs> <laughs> and call me in the morning. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is a this is banjo related question. This is from Adam. He he asks, do bands like Mumford and Sons that have popularized the banjo make you feel one way or another about the history of the banjo? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if those Mumford and Sons have made it to the Hot 100, though. Uh, yeah, but but just to elaborate on the question, I just um. I'm just hyped to see people doing it and using it, and I'm hoping that we get to see. Um, a new generation of people come to the instrument and maybe some of them getting reconnected with their heritage and their power. And so if it's via Mumford and Sons and a bunch of songs where people are saying hey all the time, so be it. <laughs> get that medicine however you can get it. Hey. <laughs> all right, this is a question from Kitty and it's about Dr. Ford. She asked, how, doc how did Dr. Ford get into college and med school at that mm. time? So few colleges allowed women to matriculate. Black women, too. So she went to a homeopathic college, Herring Medical College in Chicago, which had men and women from all backgrounds attending that school. It continued until it was absorbed by another university probably in the 1920s, around 1923 or so. But when you go back and you look at the student body at Herring Medical College in Chicago and, and understanding where in the country that's located, they had a multi-ethnic and uh, different genders in the school. So she was the first black woman licensed physician in Colorado, but she wasn't necessarily the first black woman to attend Herring. So they, they've got an incredibly rich history with their medical students. That's amazing. All right, another question coming in. This is a crossover question. This is from Micah. Micah wonders, which was more taboo? Talking about the banjo or Dr. Ford getting divorced from a minister? I'll gong this one. Well, I would have to say knowing Dr. Ford and, and understanding from my family the type of woman that she was, she didn't mince words. She doesn't play that. Don't. She, she tells it like it is. So the fact of the matter is that she moved on with her life. Reverend Ford moved to Florida, moved on with his life. Everybody at Zion Baptist Church knew that. And then she married Mr. Allen. You find her, her headstone at Fairmont is Justina Lorena Warren, maiden name Ford Allen. She kept Ford because all of her, all of her patients knew her as that, so she didn't change her name professionally. But... All the neighbors knew, my grandparents, great-grandparents, everybody knew that it wasn't taboo and it wasn't, it wasn't um, a hush-hush thing. Mm. Dr. Ford's life and how she lived her life was very crystal clear. She, she had this in incredible integrity. She was about business. Fact of the matter is, yeah, he had something else to do and I did too. We had to figure out our own past and that's what we did. That's who she is. There's no, there's no, hmm. oh my God, what happened? Mm -mm. Not in Dr. Ford's life. That's not who she was. That's great. Right, I guess the banjo then. 
I guess the banjo is more taboo. Have anything to add there? My phone locked. There we go. All right. Uh, you both spoke so passionately. This is from Carlene. Uh, you both spoke so passionately and eloquently about the past and the future. What can we do today to shape a future that you'd both be proud to speak about? Ooh, how much time do we have? <laughs> so I, I guess you can tell with me it's making sure that I honor my ancestors, honor the history that we have, hoping that people hear and understand the things that have happened before so that we can have a brighter future. Because the scary part for me right now is I am witnessing history repeating itself. I am witnessing efforts to put Jim Crow laws back in place. And if we understand the impact that our ancestors have had up to now, then everybody in here should stand up and say that history needs to move forward for equity, fairness, respect, honor, and integrity on behalf of everyone in here mm -hmm. and everyone on the planet. I'll stop there because I can stand here and talk to you for about 10 more hours about <laughs> what that means, but look at your history and understand what happened so that when you move forward, you make sure that tomorrow brings a better day. Every single day when you get up, live your best and a most amazing life, but also make sure that your neighbor can live their most amazing life and that everybody has an opportunity to to uh, look forward to their children having a wonderful life. It is so scary to get up in the morning now and see all the things that we're having to deal with. So please, please, please get up and stand up for a better planet, a better society, <laughs> treating your neighbors respectfully, everybody having an opportunity to live an amazing life. Please stand up and, and make that part of your mantra. Stand up. Make that vow. That's the homework assignment. Make that vow to make sure your neighbors have an amazing life and an opportunity. Because we all share the same planet. We all share this life together. So we need to make sure that happens. Well, that is the perfect note to wrap this Q&A up. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you so Thank much, you. Stefan. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And now, it's prize time. All right. Going back. All right. Every week we give a prize to the person who makes the best connection and our MCA Denver's digital producer, Cheyenne Michaels, is in charge of choosing who the winner is. And Cheyenne has chosen her favorite question of the night, and the person who submitted it will receive an MCA Denver membership and a tote bag. So imagine you could look so stylish, just like Lacey here carrying that tote bag, visiting the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver with your membership. And the winner for the best question tonight, let's see... It's coming in live on my phone. The winner tonight is O-Dog. Yeah. O-Dog, you're here in the audience. That's fantastic. All right. Well, after, come find me after the show, and uh, we will arrange for your MCA Denver membership and tote bag. All right. Congratulations. Well done. What was the question? Oh, gosh. Well, that you would ask that, of course. And that's like a lot of things on my phone. I will, I will come back to that at, at, the, at the night. There's like too many tabs. I'm sorry. We are figuring that out. Oh, since the banjo was used to help Lincoln with his depression, would Dr. Ford consider it as a medical instrument for her patients? That was a great question. Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, 
and to Charlie in the back of the room for helping me out there. All right, uh, now I would very much like to invite Mahogany back to the stage to enlighten us with an original poem inspired by tonight's talks. Mahogany is a Denver-based spoken word artist. She is an actress and a playwright. She will be joined by Stefan Brackett, who will be performing on the banjo while she <laughs> performs her poem. So please welcome Mahogany. So I was twiddling my fingers and writing this poem live and trying to listen because, oh my God, they were so amazing um, what they presented. So thank you to Miss Terry Gentry and Stephen, who's going to accompany, accompany, accompany me, can I talk today, on the banjo. So I hope you guys enjoy. This poem I call Legends. Have you ever been told you weren't good enough? That your unique structure somehow doesn't fit the cookie cut mold That you were odd, out of place Didn't belong, rejected, excluded, dropped, abandoned, refused Just simply because of the way you were structured Brick by brick, built to be seen in museums Past purple mountains bigger than Zion Used for blackface entertainment But I don't understand why white men are so threatened by a colored woman See the phrase not good enough was only used to dismantle their purpose Just because of their surface and their service Today, I met a legend I met a legend and icon that emerged me back into their African roots. They taught me that I am my history to begin with. My history birthed over 7,000 souls to the sounds of popping, snapping, racism and enslavement, banjo hands, banjo hands, plucking power of precious peace that nurture round pot bellies of the community. A mother's love played melodiously Adult beat against the drum membrane while plugged into the umbilical cords. Five strings, five fingers, five points will resound to the keys of babies trying to escape from being passengers on a slave trade while other musical sounds could help distortion of today. What could they be? Something that can orchestrate joy from a history of hurt, played so elegant and aggressive for all people black white and brown, a healing magic that can resound today. Did I mention that I met a legend and an icon? The lady doctor, legend. The baby doctor, legend. Banjo, icon, banjuke, icon. Opening up portals, I only wish I could dip my toes in, so thank you for allowing my words to speak your story in all of its glory. For when all the fear, hate, and even some death is over. We will really be brothers as God intended us to be in this land. This I believe, and for this, I have worked my whole life. Thank you. Oh wow, thank you Mahogany. That was great, thank you audience. And thank you to our presenting sponsor, Blue Room. Blue Room is a private investment company born of invention, forward thought, and hope. Through best-in-class investing, they create a space to amplify the power of human togetherism. Togetherism means together we can accomplish anything. And thank you to Terry and to Stefan, and thanks to you, our audience, both here in person in the ballroom, and for those of you who are joining at home, please take a moment to fill out the survey that is coming to you on your phones right now. It really helps us out. We hope to see you next week for Alien Communication and Shoddy Fabric. Thank you so much. Good night.